Zoe Pound, one of the most feared operations in American history. A story of guys who came from the roughest circumstances and created a dominant money-making machine. In this video, you'll see how they infiltrated the music industry and had major rappers shaking in their boots. Zoe Pound is a story that has never gotten the major coverage that you think it would. But that ends today. Welcome to Swamp Stories. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram Instagram page as well. So let's get into it. The story begins in Haiti, a small country located 800 miles south of Florida. Haiti is an extremely prideful country, proud of their rebellion and overtaking the French rule. But unfortunately, Haiti has had its fair share of problems as well. In fact, it's been the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere since the 1960s. Sadly, over 80% of the population lives below the poverty line. So starting in the 60s and 70s, many Haitians began fleeing the country. Some went to France and Quebec, but the vast majority settled in the nearest city they could. Welcome to Miami, Florida, the biggest hotspot for Haitians. Dade County welcomed over 200,000 Haitian immigrants by the 1980s, but two areas in particular had the largest population. First, you have Lemon City, which is now known as Little Haiti, and second is Carroll City, located northwest of Miami proper. These were two of the most affordable areas in South Florida, but they were also some of the roughest. By many accounts, life was really difficult for Haitian families early on. First, Firstly, the parents spoke no English, which made finding employment pretty difficult. And most importantly, the teenagers were bullied for their accents at school. For teenagers in Little Haiti, they attended Edison High, probably one of the roughest schools in Dade County. Here they faced off with local sections like the Sap Boys, who often pushed them around. So eventually, the Haitian teenagers got together and started the Sable Boys. At first, it was all about unity and protection at school and in the neighborhood. The Sable Boys were started by a man and named Jimmy Casimir, also known as Mac Azo. Mac was fierce, tough, and not scared of a single soul. So within a month, over a dozen Sable Boys joined his side. Quickly, the Sable Boys versus Sap Boys rivalry took over Little Haiti. Well, the same phenomenon was taking place at Carroll City High School, another rough place to be. There, a young man named Ali Adam, also known as Zoe, got all of his community together. He knew that without protection, the Haitians were toast in the rough streets of Carroll City. So therefore, he started the Carroll City Haitians, also known as CCH. Ali Adam was tough as nails, from the same cloth as Mac Azo. Well, after high school was done, they both wanted to make some money. Ali Adam and Mac Azo both had crazy ambition, just went about it in completely different ways. We start off with Ali's life in Carroll City. This guy was highly intelligent and truly wanted to build wealth for him and those around him. So early on, Ali got heavily involved in the game, if you know what I mean. He was able to stack up a good amount of money over the first few years. But his goal was to eventually get out of this life and become a legitimate businessman. To do this, he made sure to keep as low-key as possible and to work his side hustles as well. But Ali Adam was not the only one getting money. Mac Azo was getting money as well, except he was wild and reckless. Mac was no businessman, instead he loved hitting licks with his crew. So the Sable Boys became known as the slimiest crew in Miami. So for this reason, Ali Adam always stayed away from Mac Azo. He knew that they could either set him up or bring the wrong attention to his organization. But then came the summer of 1990, the year that changed everything. For whatever reason, the Sap Boys believed that Ali Adam had taken sides with Mac Azo. This was not true. Regardless, this is what they believed. July 6, 1990. The Sap Boys gear up and take a trip to Carroll City. They pull up to CCH's infamous block on 27th, and there they spot multiple members hanging outside. Thankfully, everyone was okay, but regardless, Ali Adam was definitely pissed. He had done his best to avoid this nonsense, but now he knew that he needed to gear up. So the next day, he did something that he never thought he would do. He called up Makazo and asked for a meeting. Makazo was excited and accepted it on the spot. So the next day, Ali Adam and his trusted associates pulled up to Makazo's headquarters. During the meeting, Ali explained the situation and why he needed Makazo's help. Well, 
But long story short, they came to an agreement to join together as one. Ali was the brains and money maker, and Makazo was the cold enforcer. It was the perfect yin yang situation with all of the grounds covered. Now, all they needed was a name, which took a while to find. Finally, in 1993, a top member named Chubb came up with a name. While all of the members were hanging out, a song by the Dog Pound came on the radio. Randomly, Chubb yelled out, F the Dog Pound, this is the Zo Pound. Zo is a Creole word for bone, which represents toughness and strength. All of the members instantly loved it, and it officially became their new name. Welcome to the Zopound. Now let me explain how they operated. Instead of a color, the Zopound only represent the Haitian flag. This way, police could never identify them or see them as suspicious. On top of this, hand signals and Zopound tattoos were not allowed. All of this makes Zopound members hard to identify from regular civilians. And this worked in their favor, because for a long time, they remained under the radar. All of this while being the most dangerous in the whole state of Florida. And I'm not just saying that because the numbers back it up. The Sap Boys vs. Zopound rivalry got really deep. Between May of 1995 and August of 1996, Miami police believe that Zopound claimed the lives of 40 Sap Boys members. And on August 5th of 1995, Ali and Makazo were arrested for 18 of these bodies. However, after lack of evidence, the charges were dropped. The Sap Boys were never heard of after 1996, so the Zo Pound would move on to their next chapter. After Ali and Makazo no longer needed each other, they kind of went their separate ways. So let's start off with Makazo. Mac had no interest in spending money to make money. Instead, he wanted to go from zero to a million, pretty much taking for free and selling for whatever. But Mac was no dummy. In fact, his operations were pretty interesting intricate, so let me explain what he did. Since the 1980s, the Port of Haiti became the stopping point for ships between Colombia and Miami. And if you know anything about what can be shipped from Colombia to Miami, then you know what I'm talking about. Well, when these ships were filled with you know what, the Colombians would tip off the Haitian port workers to let them pass. So because of this, the workers knew what ships were containing what and when they were arriving in Miami. Well, by this time, the Zo Pound had spread to Haiti. I hope you know where I'm going with this. Makazo was able to get Zopound members to work at the port, so the workers would inform Makazo anytime a dirty ship was coming to shore. March 4th, 1997. Makazo gets a call from a Zopound member in Haiti who brings him big news. A large cargo ship called the Larche Dende will arrive in Miami tomorrow night, and the ship contains over $6 million worth of you know what. Makazo gets excited and immediately calls up four fellow members. Together, they spend the night drawing up a game plan of how they'll jack the ship. To clear the way, they made sure to pay off the guard on duty at the Miami port. The next day, March 5th, 1997, 11 11 p.m. The Larche Dende approaches the port and the Zopound members are ready to pounce. As soon as it docks, the five members run onto the ship. They direct all of the crew members to the cabin and tie them up. Then Makazo tells them to direct him to the hidden goods. While all of this is happening, one man is unaccounted for. This would be the captain of the ship, who Makazo completely forgot about. The captain jumps off the ship and swims to the shore. He then alerts Miami police to what's going down. 1 a.m. 20 police cars arrive and surround the ship. Makazo and his four members surrender and are taken in. This is it. Major federal charges are on the way. Or maybe not. Because the Larche Den they didn't want to be investigated, they told police that it was all a misunderstanding. Makazo and his crew were instantly released and the Larche Dende was never investigated. Because he got away with this, Makazo wanted to try again. July 13th, 1997. Makazo gets another call from the port of Haiti. A major ship called the Vanderpool Express is on its way to the port of Miami. It comes in the same night as the call, so Makazo has no time to plan. And sadly, this would lead to a disaster. On the morning of July 14th, 1997, four Vanderpool Express crew members lost their lives. Somehow, Makazo's charges were dropped again. 
However, he would be arrested for another similar case a month later, and after a long trial, Makazo and his fellow members received life sentences. These incidents gave Zo Pound a terrible reputation and actually had further consequences. It ruined all of the business that Ali Adam was conducting. So by 1999, Ali retired from the lifestyle and chose a different path. He used his leftover cash to buy businesses all over the Miami area. This included a subway in Miami Lakes and an entire strip mall in Miami Gardens. In fact, the FBI estimates that his net worth was $11 million, which was a lot of money in 1999. But this lifestyle was slow and honestly boring for Ali. It simply couldn't compare to the excitement of being a Zopound leader. So that's when Ali Adam came up with his new master plan. He launched the House of Fire, Miami's newest record label. At the time, New Orleans had cash money Houston had rap a lot and Atlanta had so so death. But Miami didn't have a real presence in the rap game, and that's where Ali wanted to come in. The only problem was that Miami was short on talent, so the industry was not paying attention to House of Fire. This got under Ali's skin, so he resorted to another way to do it. He decided that when any rapper came to Miami, they better check in with Zo Pound. The first person to check in was Birdman and his whole Cash Money crew. In fact, Ali, Adam, and Birdman developed a strong relationship over 2001. The story goes that Birdman lost a $50,000 dice game to some Zo Pound members. And instead of making Birdman pay up, Ali, Adam spotted him $50,000. And this kind gesture is ultimately how Zo Pound locked in with Cash Money. But Ali, Adam, good deed was not without an expected return. He expected the major artists he protected to do features for his up and coming artists. It was kind of like a very friendly way of extorting the industry. And if an artist ever disagreed, he had to go against the whole Zo Pound. Well that takes us to the year 2004. For those of you old enough to remember, a Houston rapper named Lil Flip was on top of the game. With major hits like Sunshine and Game Over, Lil Flip was the rapper that everyone wanted to book. Well, in 2003, Ali Adam had booked Lil Flip for $10,000. And just a year later, Lil Flip was charging $75,000. But for Ali, Flip offered to do the show for $60,000. So they agreed on the booking and Ali put posters all over the city. Everyone was excited that Lil Flip was coming to town and it was a great look for Ali's promotions. Well, overnight the show sold out, but then things would go left. The night before the show, Ali gets a call from Lil Flip's management. They tell him that Lil Flip will not be able to make the show. At this point, Ali had already sent over the $20,000 deposit. So Lil Flip's management tells him that they'll return the $20,000. Ali Adam was pissed and he told the management that he needs $50,000 for the inconvenience. Lil Flip's manager would not pay the fee and he ended up hanging up the call. Ooh, this got his blood boiling. No one had ever disrespected him like this before. So Ali called him right back and gave him his final warning. You either pay me the money or Zo Pound will get rid of Lil Flip. Lil Flip's team was not scared and they hung up the phone. This was bad news for Lil Flip, and he had no idea who he had pissed off. Zo Pound had officially put a target on Lil Flip's back, and somehow word got around to a boss named Jimmy Henchman. This guy has long been a well-respected mogul in the music industry, but he also had close ties to Zo Pound, and he knew that Lil Flip would not fare well in this situation. So Jimmy instantly called up Jay Prince, the so-called King of Houston. Jay Prince owned the label that Lil Flip was signed to, so he had had every interest to mend the relationship. So Jay Prince called up Ali Adam and told him that Lil Flip would send the 50,000. Ali was happy, but then he waited, waited, and waited even longer. He never got the 50,000 from Lil Flip. So a month later, he called up Lil Flip and asked him what's the deal. Lil Flip then offered to send him 22,000. Ali hung up the phone and went to his last resort. Two weeks later, Ali receives inside information that Lil Flip is coming to Miami. He learns that he has an overnight recording session with the famous producer Scott Storch. Storch's studio happens to be located in North Miami, right next to Little Haiti. Well, at 10 p.m., Lil Flip leaves the airport in a 2004 Maserati. He arrives to the studio at midnight, and that's where four Zopound members are waiting for him. They wait across the street all night until he comes out. 
4 a.m. Little Flip leaves the studio and walks to his Maserati. But right there are the Zopound members. They take Lil Flip and put him in their car. Then they bring him to the White House where Ali is waiting for him. He tells Flip that he needs his 50000 Flip has no choice but to agree, so he follows the orders. This was an industry secret until Zopound came out with a book in 2020. That was 2004, and now we're in 2005, a year that changed the hip-hop scene forever. In September of 2005, New Orleans was hit with Hurricane Katrina, which wiped out most of the city. This included the Cash Money Estate in New Orleans East. So immediately, the entire Cash Money moved their operations to Miami, including Lil Wayne. As we know, Cash Money had a great relationship with the Zopound, so the transition was easy. But as soon as they got to town, Ali Adam was already expecting favors. He wanted to push his new artist Basil Knight, and he asked Lil Wayne to give him a feature to jumpstart his career. The first time he asked, Lil Wayne said he was too busy and to call him back in a couple of weeks. The second time, Lil Wayne told him that he's not in Miami. And the third time, Lil Wayne allegedly hung up the phone. Ali was pissed at Lil Wayne and accused him of chumping a gangster. But due to his respect for Birdman, Ali gave Lil Wayne one more chance. A year later in 2006, Lil Wayne is getting a tattoo at the Hit Factory in Miami. Somehow, Ali gets word of his location and decides to pull up. So an hour later, Ali and his crew walk in the studio. Ali says, what's up Lil D, to which Wayne responds, what's up? Lil Wayne already knows what he's there for, so he tells him to pass him the CD. He then puts the CD into the studio sound system and gives it a listen. Midway through the track, Lil Wayne pauses it. Tell your boy to step up his game if he wants to mess with me. Ali is pissed, but tries to offer an alternative situation. He asks Wayne if he can invite Basil to the studio and teach him how to rap. Wayne shakes his head and says, I don't have time for this. Ali does not appreciate this, so he walks up to Wayne and snatches the diamond chains off his neck. He then tells Wayne that he has 24 hours to leave Miami or else the whole Zoe Pound will go against him. Wayne scoffs at him and Ali leaves the studio. Lil Wayne had 24 hours to leave Miami, but he didn't go anywhere. Over the next 48 hours, the Cash Money tour bus was hit up 67 times. And two days later, Lil Wayne's Rolls Royce Phantom was sent to flames. Zo Pound was not playing and the music industry needed to stop this. Music moguls like Russell Simmons even tried to intervene, but it was unsuccessful. The beef was really on, Cash Money vs. Zo Pound. This lasted for a short while until one man came back around. Jimmy Henchman was the only person who could get through to Ali, so he flew down to Miami to have a meeting. He was able to make a deal with Ali, and here's what it was. Lil Wayne had to shout out Zopound on future songs and hand over $180,000 to Ali. For some reason, I don't believe the second part, but that's what Zopound says. Well, the deal went through, and Lil Wayne and Ali met up at DJ Khaled's party. Wayne even signed his rapper Briscoe to make things right. As you can see in this clip, Zopound has been showing love to Jimmy Henchman ever since. And for Lil Wayne, he shouted out Zopound on on multiple songs. If you know what the songs are, let me know in the comments. Well, long story short, Zoe Pound has extorted the music industry for years, and there's probably stories that we'll never know. This whole time, police could never seem to take them down. However, all of that would change in 2007. September 1st, 2007. Here we are in Lee County, located in Southwest Florida. Yuck, for those who don't know, this is the Fresno of Florida. Or no, maybe that would be the Panhandle. Either way, this place is gross. Well, on this day, four Zopound members are set to complete a transaction with three Lee County men. So early in the morning, they take the long drive down I-75 to Bonita Springs. At 3 p.m., the Zopound members arrive at a beautiful home on Esplanade Street. There, the members are greeted by three men. Scott Highfill, Robert Barkley, and Willard Graham. These three men are shysty, with long records dating back to the 1980s. But the Zoes don't know that. They think that this will be a successful transaction. So off of their usual guard, the Zopound members take their product inside. For 10 minutes, they wait for the cash, but nothing is coming their way. Instead, the three men rush them out of the house. Clearly, the men have no idea who they're messing with because Zo Pound is not the people to do this to. So after chasing them away, the three men are feeling good. Well, the four Zo Pound members drive back to Miami to gear up. 
They inform their boss of what happened and he gives them the green light to head back. September 2nd, 2007. The Zopound members head back to Bonita Springs looking for the men. They arrive in the afternoon and wait outside their house until the men appear. And that's when they make their decision. <sighs> The Zopound members head back to Miami, but forgot to clean up their evidence. So within the next two days, one of the men fled to Haiti. This would be Wesno Isaac, one of the FBI's top 10 most wanted men of 2007. Eventually, they found him in Haiti and all four men were arrested. Two of them became confidential informants, which is something that's pretty common in Florida. Well, the informants eventually led to the takedown of Ali Adam. In 2009, he got 30 years for racketeering. This was a major blow to Zo Pound, but of course, the next generation would step up. However, these days, they keep an extremely low profile, so nobody knows knows what they have going on. Well, that's gonna do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Peace!